بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم Welcome to part four of our story of riba and in part three we covered the uh, culmination and the formation of the first central bank and uh, as uh, David Graeber noted in his book Debt the First 5000 Years that this was a very different type of money and this is what we would genuinely call paper money in the sense of debt based money banknotes that come into existence not as a debt owed to the king but a debt owed by the king literally um, these this money is premised on the idea that uh, someone has to go into debt um, and so this was the first independent central bank in 1694 as we noted um, 1694 the creation of the bank of england and we covered uh, the formation of the first central bank uh, being done as a result of um, a loan by 40 of the um, uh, London and Edinburgh merchants who lent 1.2 million to King William III to fight his war against France. Now, uh, these notes developed into a currency and this became the first idea of a national debt. Um, now, what happened after that is uh, very shortly after that, as I, and we also discovered how um, in, in, in the previous uh, session, how when uh, similarly things were happening in um, Holland, whereby uh, the Dutch East India Company and the, um, and, uh, the use of their bank had formed a new setup whereby um, the Amsterdam Exchange Bank, the, the Whistle Bank, uh, was now accepting the shares of the first joint stock company to, um, to, as collateral for its loans, therefore bringing a link between the stock market and the supply of credit. And the next step was for the banks themselves to lend the money so that this credit could be bought. And this brings about a new triangular formulation whereby uh, whereby uh, the money is now used literally to fund the, the rise of the Dutch Empire. And this form of uh, monopoly uh, established through finance became a pattern. And that's why uh, what starts happening already is that uh, ordinary banks start creating money as well, obviously on the back of the central bank. This new form of credit money that comes into being and uh, what also becomes apparent is that there is a, always a degree of financial speculation so unmoored from oh, uh, with no, in the lack of any legal or community constraints uh, we see the first signs of this in the dutch republic holland was in modern day holland which having pioneered the development of stock markets uh, undergoes the tulip mania, which is basically uh, a series of speculative bubbles, uh, as they come to be known, based on future prices and, and the bidding of the true investors. And uh, what follows then is what's known as the famous South Sea bubble. Now, this is <laughs> ironically, this is again another charter issued through the government to support. Uh, um, basically a monopoly of trade with the Spanish colonies, right? Uh, South America and so on. And usually this trade is slave trade. And this is, so what we find is that in almost every case, this is now happening, a new joint stock corporation is formed. Uh, of course, the most famous one that most of us would know would be the East India Company. And it's formed around some prospective colonial venture and then as a result, this uh, thing happens. And a, another very famous case of that, and it's something worth studying, is, is the story of uh, John Law. John Law was this kind of S Scottish, kind of very interesting. He was on, on the run because he was prosecuted for uh, a murder that he committed in a duel over a woman. And he escaped from England and he was known for gambling. And then all of a sudden he finds himself in, in France primarily because of the immense debts that the king had run up, uh, King Louis. Uh, and so um, 
the, the, the immense debts run up ensured that the government was on the brink of its bankruptcy, it was, it was, you know, and they were they needed to revise their their system, and they were willing to uh, engage the ideas of John Law, whose effective solution was to create a famous Bank Royale, another central bank experiment now in 1717, following on the English central bank. But what he does then is that um, he, similar to the Bank of England, this grows so quickly that he absorbs through this the French colonial trading companies, and one of the great companies becomes the Mississippi Company, which is the French, another a joint venture company that's now fighting wars in um, in, the, in the Americas. Now, this French colonial company <laughs> ends up issuing so much that when it defaults and it's unable to uh, actually bring back returns, it not only crashes itself, but it brings back the entire crown's debt, brings back the entire government's debt. And this results in uh, 1721 it coming to an end and John Law literally fleeing for his life. It's worth studying his life as a kind of a case study on what becomes a pattern. I mean, the French were so burnt by that that they didn't reset another central bank until uh, Napoleon Bonaparte in 1800. But the point being that now we see a rise of um, these very powerful uh, banking houses and, and none more powerful perhaps than the House of Rothschild, which was uh, an original Jewish banking family. Uh, the father uh, had established the banking family in Frankfurt, but then he had five sons and then he split these five sons across the cities of Vienna, Paris, Naples, Frankfurt, and London. Perhaps amongst the most famous of, of, of these brothers is Nathan Rothschild uh, in London. But what happens is during the course of the 18th, uh, and of course the 19th century, this is considered, the Rothschilds were considered the most powerful um, banking uh, uh, entity. And uh, a lot of that also goes back in part to certain decisions that were taken uh, by Rothschilds on the back of war. Famously, uh, the, the war that Napoleon loses, back at the Battle of Waterloo, and uh, many of Nathan Rothschild's positions that he takes on the, um, on, on the bonds, and buying them, expecting them to go up, and uh, earning huge amounts of money that way. So, so this, inside, this becomes a new pattern of, of economy. And uh, David Graeber uh, quotes uh, a statement that's a, ascribed to Lord Josiah Charles Stamp, the former director of the Bank of England, and he says, the modern banking system manufactures money out of, manufactures money out of nothing. The process is perhaps the most astounding piece of sleight of hand that was ever invented. Banking was conceived in iniquity and born in sin. Bankers are on the earth, take it away from them, but leave them with the power to create credit. And with the stroke of a pen, they will create enough money to buy it back again. If you wish to remain slaves of bankers and pay the cost of your own slavery, then let them continue to create deposits. Now, whether this statement is actually true or not, David Graeber makes the interesting point that it remains the most often quoted passage by critics of modern banking. And it's for the reason that it strikes a chord, because the reality is bankers are creating money out of nothing. And um, they, their fundamental problem is that they are now citing that the markets themselves operate through greed. And so irrelevant, what we find now is because money is coming into, into existence as interest-bearing debt, and all of the countries are now under the pressure of satisfying this debt pressure, then this becomes, as David Graeber says, that this produces a system that demands constant, endless growth. And so while it was early on in the early stages, we saw the Spanish and Portuguese expeditions into the Americas and the importation of New World gold and silver to Europe, it's now these innovations of the world's first central bank and the monetary counterpart of being chartered joint stock companies that begin funding these colonialist expeditions, right? And so both the Dutch and the British East India companies come into existence. And David Graeber, and we know what both of these companies do. I mean, uh, David Graeber says that from 1700s, he says, starting from the baseline date of 1700, what we see at the dawn of this system, which he calls modern capitalism, 
is a giant financial apparatus of credit and debit that operates in practical effect to pump more and more labor out of just about everyone with whom it comes into contact. And as a result, producing an endlessly expanding volume of material goods. At every point, the familiar but peculiarly European entanglement of war and commerce reappears, often in startling new forms. Almost all of the bubbles of the 18th century involved some fantastic scheme to use the proceeds of colonial ventures to pay for European wars. Paper money was debt money, and debt money was war money, and this remained the case. Right? So this kind of crazy um, funding of this profit-seeking uh, ventures of like co co controlling the world uh, starts revolving around three major forms of trade, the arms trade, the slaves trade, and the drug trade. And we should remember that uh, Western Europeans had no cons in dealing with slave. So I'll just take a pause here with the Adam. The Adam is going. So inshallah, we will resume our, our um, afterwards. So, not, so just to recover, um, just to revisit what we were discussing, and um, the, as the, this new start, type of economy starts evolving, this new financial economy premised on debt money, which is placed primarily premised on war money, uh, David uh, Graeber starts noting that, you know, this, this kind of absurd uh, thing of seeing that uh, the, the first stock markets in Holland, Britain, are based mainly on trading shares of the East and West India companies. And they're all military and trading ventures. And for a century, uh, East India Company, which is a private company, it was a profit seeking corporation, governed India until it was taken over by, by, the, um, by the state. Um, and uh, the national debts of England, France, and others were based on money, money basically taken from, from, uh, from, uh, from the, you know, used to acquire the gunpowder needed to bombard cities and to construct camps for holding the holding of prisoners and the training recruits all around. Almost all the bubbles of the 18th century that we see, the bubbles of these bursting and expanding companies that basically can't meet their debts, involve some fantastic scheme to use the proceeds of, of, of debt for colonial ventures to pay for European war. Now, in this endless European expansion of war uh, and employing, th there are three major trades. There was the arms trade, there was the slave trade, and the drug trade. And just on this topic, we shouldn't assume that there wasn't a, a very effective, because at the same time when supposedly slavery was being outlawed in England, uh, David Graeber makes the point, it's the secret scandal of the system that at no point has it not been organized around effectively slavery of what we, we would consider free labor. Because... Uh, the co in the earlier stages, it was well known when, okay, Americas were conquer conquered, then this began with mass enslavement, and then settled into various forms of debt enslavement or, or importing African slaves or indentured service. Uh, you know, we find that this was being used as a system all around. And it's not necessarily race oriented, even though primarily it was sad that there were many African slaves there. But, you know, even on plantations from Barbados to Mauritius, they were using contract laborers, either people who are ex-convicts or who were being forced into contract, or um, th they would recruit mainly uh, poor people as laborers from India and China. Chinese contract laborers built the North American railroad system. And Indian, Indian coolies, who are usually these luggage carriers, built the South African mines. And it, sometimes it would even be uh, poor people from other white countries, such as peasants, Russian, Poland, who had been free landholder, landholders, landholders for several centuries. Um, they were used. Uh, just we'll pause it. So um, a lot of the um, peasants of Russia and Poland were used as as lands as serfs, effectively working on the land. Um, and the rich people who were the landholders. And, I mean, this was happening in England as well. There was a, effectively, if you looked at the land, the land was held within a very a receding number of uh, aristocrats. And it was effectively, um, you know, um, 
a large people people were tied by the labor to the lands but on a global scale the, the colonial the colonial regimes um, especially in Africa and Southeast Asia uh, regularly so, no, so it just continues so um, colonial regimes in Africa and Southeast Asia regularly demanded forced labor from their conquered subjects or they alternatively created tax systems designed to force the population into the labor market through debt and so for example British overlords in India starting with initially the East India Company but continuing well into Her Majesty's government institutionalized debt peonage as their primary means of creating products for sales abroad. And so this is the onset of, of colonization. Um, and so just to look at, you know, just for example, uh, Richard Douthwaite, who's written a, a book about this, uh, mentions that, that basically by the end of the 19th century, uh, France had secured, especially with regards to Africa. So Africa became a, a, an interesting example of how this credit-fueled colonialist impulse kind of leads to conquering much of the world. So Africa, uh, which is uh, um, the second largest and second most populous continent in the world, uh, ended up by the end of the 19th century having close to 96% of its land mass incorporated into the profit-making remit of a European state. So Richard Douthwaite says, by the end of the 19th century, France had secured 4 million square miles, Britain 3 million uh, square miles, and Germany, Portugal, Belgium, and Italy about 900,000 each. Only two countries in Africa, Liberia and Ethiopia, just constituting 4% of a continent the same size as the United States, Australia, and India, and China put together, were not incorporated into the supply and marketing system of the major world power. And obviously we're aware of the same thing applying to uh, Asia. So just to give an example, and this is something that um, Niall Ferguson also touches upon, as to how um, the British were very much involved in drug trade as well as slave trade. And so um, when uh, the Chinese picked up that the British were trading in opium, then they uh, contacted, because the, to them, on a moral level, they wouldn't think that this could be something done by the Queen. But, but then when this was initiated, uh, the gunships were sent from England, and effectively, uh, the British formed or carved out Hong Kong as an independent charter that was now subject to the Crown and no longer subject to uh, the Chinese. And... Um, you know, uh, the same thing happened. So basically, this was just a, a way to market opium in China. Uh, and then later on in India, we find the same thing, the, the cloth trade, which is one of the reasons why Gandhi was so keen on um, establishing uh, khaki as an alternative cloth, because the British basically used, once they took over India, they shut down the efficient Indian cotton export trade, and it became a supply system to the British. And so um, these are some of the things that were happening. And this was kind of the early mold of globalization. I mean, many of you may know the story of the Middle East and how the British literally carved up the Middle East. Um, and of course, uh, tragically, the Ottoman Empire was, a, was kind of in that kind of dimension in the sense that uh, the Ottoman Empire itself got embroiled in certain wars, namely the Crimean War. And as a result of the Crimean War, which is fought with the Russians, uh, the British and the French ended up supplying money and the Ottoman Empire ended up being indebted to Britain and France. And on the back of that, we find the emergence of the, fa the same central banking model within the Ottoman Empire. And a lot of this played a role in terms of the efficacy or the so-called power of the Ottomans. And of course, uh, as part of the Ottomans' own, especially after the First World War, which... Um, itself, Richard Douthwaite says, began because of the, the, the populist powers of Europe having reached a level of outward saturation means that they're going to compete with themselves. And uh, Germany especially had come rather late to the territory grabbing game. And so unhappy with what it had got, uh, this was one of the reasons why the First World War happened. And there's other reasons, but the Ottomans got pulled into it. And on the back of that, 
then we find that they lose a lot of their autonomy straight after the Battle of Bat because of the, the, the loss. And of course, the Germans were lumped also with the, with, the, with the debt that in turn leads to hyperinflation. That in turn was a big part of what kind of led to um, uh, basically the, um, the Second World War, partly because what emerges outside after the First World War because of uh, the hyperinflation and the economic and political tensions, we find that the Second World War uh, being precipitated because of uh, the rise of fascism and uh, mainly Hitler, for example. So we can see that this kind of expansion and this territory grabbing game leads to a kind of a problem eventually because this the European powers start imploding and fighting each other. And the Second World War was kind of like the fight, the far, the, the last result of that and so what comes after that was okay we need a, we need to come up with a new architecture and what comes after that uh, was the formation of a new global financial architecture in 1944 in what's known as the Bretton Woods agreement but in that agreement itself now we can see as people like Nine Ferguson and others have commented that is it was it really a new form of uh, architecture because what was previously done through colonization, through the gunboats and the power of the state, was now going to be done through um, multilateral trade agreements and structural adjustment policies and various other ways. And so uh, it was still very much an imperialist agenda. But this is something we'll discuss in the next presentation. For now, we'll stop at this. Subhanak wa bihamdik, subhanahu al-azim, wal-asr inna min sana fi khusr, illa ladina anhu anhu salihati wa tuasur al-haqi wa tuasur al-salam. Assalamu alaikum wa